What is the role of the first lady? How has that role developed over the course of American history? And what can we learn about activism, patriotism, and diplomacy from our first ladies? We'll answer all of these questions and more on this edition of Getting Schooled. I'm Abby Hornacek. Political pundits and campaign strategists have often said that the best character witness for a political candidate is their spouse. In our history, we've seen husbands and wives take the stage at rallies, on the campaign trail, and at party conventions to speak to the capability of the person they most likely know best in the world, their spouse. And last month, while we watched our major political parties host their national conventions, we got to see a lot of Dr. Jill Biden and First Lady Melania Trump. Now, many of us know that the first ladies take on initiatives for a specific issue they'd like to address during their spouse's time in office. Among other things, Barbara Bush worked towards greater literacy. Michelle Obama promoted health and education. Melania Trump brings more attention towards cyberbullying and the opioid crisis. And those initiatives are just a fraction of the job that the first lady takes on. I mean, you can understand why first ladies have an office and staff of their own in the White House. These women have been forceful catalysts in the success of our country. So what exactly is the role of the First Lady? And how has that role developed since the start of our country? Has it always looked like this? Here to answer all of these questions is Mr. Andrew Oak. And he is the author of the book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. He's the producer of the C-SPAN television show, First Ladies, Influence and Image. And he's a regular public speaker on the stories and lives of the First Ladies. Andy, you have been dubbed the First Ladies Man. So you are definitely the guy for this discussion. I am so happy to have you on the podcast. Abby, an absolute pleasure. So wonderful to be here with you today. I need to know where the name First Ladies Man came from, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the very first uh, mission, the first adventure, the first journey, the first leg that took me through Virginia in um, uh, just before the series started for C-SPAN, uh, I was going to a lot of places, uh, uh, Colonial Williamsburg, muse presidential libraries, museums, where I would go through all my travels. And everyone always started out saying, well, the president this and the president that. And, and even the people at the locations couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that we were talking about the women. And I said, look, we've heard enough about the guys. We know about the presidents. I want to hear about the women. This is all about the ladies. And people got a kick out of that. And so I put all about the ladies on my T-shirts and I started calling myself the first lady. I said, hey, look, I'm the first ladies, man. I'm here to talk about the ladies. It's all about the ladies. Let's talk about the ladies. And it just kind of it just kind of happened. And next thing you know, there's a couple of books out of it talking to wonderful people like you and presidential libraries, museums, Smithsonian schools, classes, historical groups. It's just taken off and it's been an absolute joy the entire time. I like you already. It's all about the ladies. That's, That's correct. I feel like we're going to be friends. I think we will. <laughs> Great. Well, you obviously have the backing behind your title because you have done your research and I'm really excited to get into this. So let's start with how did we get the term first lady? Because word on the street is the first ladies didn't often like being called lady. I mean, Jackie Kennedy once said it sounds like the name of a prized racehorse, right? Yeah, well, you're right. And and we struggled. We were a new country. We were trying so hard not to be England, not to be anyone else, not to be a king and queen. And we really didn't know what to call ourselves. Uh, uh, the, the, the first lady term didn't come about until around um, well, there's a lot of everyone wants to be the first if that's a good thing. And everyone wants to be the last if that's a good thing. <laughs> so a lot of people claim to be the first first lady and thing. the first woman to be called first lady. But she was not married to a president was James Buchanan's official White House hostess, his niece, Harriet Lane. The first lady married to a president that was called first lady but was not sitting first lady at the time was Dolly Madison when President uh, Taylor referred to her as the first lady in her uh, 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 eulogy at her funeral. The first sitting first lady married to a president 
was Lucy Hayes, one of my all time favorites, Rutherford B. Hayes's wife. And it really was just a struggle to 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 come into our own and, and to have this new identity. And we didn't know we didn't know that we were going to call President Washington president. And, and Mrs. Washington was called Lady Washington just because oh. it was it was you know a polite term for the day and ladies and gentlemen and eventually when there's a a a, 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 a female president uh, I'm assuming everyone assumes that it will be the first gentleman um, just based on parliamentary procedure and, and the way things go in, in politics and 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 things like that now but it, it, you're right it, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting um, uh, history of of how it all came about. Yeah, that is super fascinating because I, I was reading too. It, it was what presidentress or Mrs. President. Those were also used early on. But then we had Lady Washington because George Washington called her that as a sign of respect. And then, of course, you have um, Lady Adams, Lady Madison, that kind of thing. Sure. But it seems like it's it's kind of it's kind of stuck around. I mean, so you talk about Martha Washington. I really want to understand in this conversation how the role of the first lady has changed throughout yeah. our country's history. So let's start at the beginning. Martha Washington, how was she or how did she, um, I should say, set the tone for this role? Well, that, that's a great question, Abby. And, 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 and we'll get into how the role has changed or how it hasn't changed. I think it's going to be more interesting that we'll talk about is more our expectations have changed than the role has changed over the course of history. And I can explain that later. But getting back to your initial question of Martha Washington, the way she started it was just kind of on a whim. And and the fascinating thing is that Martha Washington does what a lot of women of her day do it's sort of the colonial version of cleansing your hard drive upon their final days. And they know the end is coming. They burn their letters. History is, is, is incinerated right before our eyes. Martha Washington did this in the third floor of Mount Vernon in Virginia. Uh, many women have had their husbands do it for them uh, as they were on their, uh, their deathbed. And, and it's because these are personal letters. They're not supposed to be written for anyone, especially before we were keeping track and before there were presidential libraries and things like that. But one letter does exist, and it's a very curious letter that addresses your question. Uh, the Adamses were kind of like uh, my uh, um, my grandfather. Um, they kept everything. There's there's over sixty thousand pages of white of uh, Adams family correspondence, family correspondence over generations at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Now, because Mrs. Adams did have this historical mind, this archival mind, and she did save everything and and knew kind of what was going on before as the Continental Congress and the formation of America and being the the first wife of the vice president, first vice president and second first lady. And there's an interesting exchange. She has the the rough draft of the letter that she wrote to Martha Washington. They were very close as as first and second lady at the time. Uh, spent a lot of time together in New York, spent a lot of time together in Philadelphia in the two first executive mansions. And the letter basically says, my dear friend, Martha, how did you do it? How, how, do you, how are you the first lady of the United States? Or how are you Lady Washington? How are you the president's wife? Of course, we didn't have the term first lady. And Martha writes back, and this is the most amazing thing, because most of Martha's letters are, are burned, but ones that she would have sent out and someone had the wherewithal, like Abigail Adams, to keep them. Mm -hmm. It basically says, my heart guided my 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 thought process. It's just, she just went with her gut. Life was her experience. These women especially in the early times before women could vote, before women could own land, uh, when, when their husbands died, all they were doing was, was they were stewards of the land and the wealth and the property for their male, uh, 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 for their sons that, that to, to pass off this land. They, they couldn't have formal educations. They didn't have jobs. They couldn't vote. And so these women of aptitude, these women of natural ability, natural intelligence would hitch their horse to the wagons of these men that they were see were going places. Most of our founding fathers married up. George Washington certainly married up. If George Washington had married any other woman than Martha Dandridge Custis, we would probably not be talking to you. Martha was right out now. of George's league. I'm sorry. Martha was out of George's league. Well, 
A little bit. I, and But the funny thing is that Martha married up. Martha Dandridge, as she was born, was doing okay for herself, but she married Daniel Park Custis, who was a step up. And Custis's father didn't want the wedding to happen because he said that Martha Dandridge is nice enough, but not of our social standing. So he met her. Talk Look at to her, her now. Said, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so she marries up with Custis, gains all this wealth, gains all this land. When she's a widow at 26, she's looking for a, 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 a Washington was a good looking guy. He, he was not doing too badly himself, a, a, a budding, uh, if not already successful uh, military career with the, with the British Army. And I mean, he was a catch for sure, but he was definitely moving up, uh, marrying up. And, and that's the way so many of these these first first ladies get onto the scene and, and and they've been advisors and they've been in the rooms and they've been these confidants from the very, very beginning. I mean, Martha Washington went to nearly every winter encampment of the Revolutionary War. Along the way, she gave press conferences. She hosted very, very important dinners with dignitaries, foreign dignitaries, military uh, um, uh, officials and officers who, who were who were carrying this this revolutionary war. And and if George Washington couldn't if, if Martha Washington couldn't take care of all this wealth and land and children that she had with her first husband and, and all this other stuff, Washington would have had to do it. If Washington had to do it, he couldn't have started the Revolutionary War. One can't happen without the other. And the modern world looks very different without America in it. It's, it's, that's a, almost a silly thing to say. But to think that this rests on the shoulders, not squarely, but, but pretty firmly on a 26-year-old widow, uh, Martha Washington is the first successful female CEO in the colonies. <laughs> I like the way you phrase that. And, and it's so it's so incredible to hear you explain it too, as she just said, look, I, w- I went with my heart because that's all that you could do. There was no one before her to exactly. actually follow. Exactly. So you, you talk about how she kind of set the tone for this role, right? I mean, you fast forward to now, 20, 20th century first ladies, you know, they've sponsored national and international causes like environmentalism, volunteerism, women's rights, literacy, you know, that kind of thing. So how would you say that the role from Martha Washington to now Melania Trump has evolved over the years? That's a great way of asking it, Abby, evolved because it has evolved because this is an unelected and an unpaid position. Mm -hmm. There's no job description. So it's whatever the first lady wants to make it for herself. And we've come to expect more. Each first lady has always done philanthropic things, especially around wartime with orphans of the Civil War, orphans of the Revolution. But now we come to think that this is part of the job description. And it's not that they're doing much different because first ladies have always had this philanthropic mind, especially when it comes to children and the well-being of humanity. It's just that we know about it and expect it and almost demand it now as if it was a paid or elected role. And unfortunately for the first lady, we criticize her as though there is some sort of job description, payment or election. Yeah. I, unlike the president, the role of the first lady isn't outlined in the Constitution. So how do you think each woman learns as she does she learn on the job? Does she talk to former and past um, first ladies? How does that work? Well, this is a unique sorority of women, and there is no one who understands what it's like other than another first lady. There is a lot of chit chat between Uh, Melania Trump uh, cited Michelle Obama as a role model, as an influence. But for the most part, these women do what they care about. And you very much see this with Melania Trump. I've said from the beginning that if there was ever a first lady that didn't have to do anything and didn't need this job or necessarily even want this job from a little girl, you know, I don't think Melania Trump was growing up in Slovenia saying, I want to be first lady. (laughs) And now here she is. So when we see her doing the things that she does, especially for children, especially anti-drugs, uh, she does a lot of stuff that's sort of off to the side and not heavily publicized. And she got off to kind of a quiet start because she's only doing things that she cares about and not doing the things that they, that she thinks she has to do. So I think in Melania, we get a very genuine first lady. It's someone who does things because she wants to, not because she thinks she has to, because I don't think she does things that she thinks people expect that she should be doing. She's definitely her own woman. Right, right. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting way to look at it. And when you think about first ladies in general, someone who comes to my mind is Jackie Kennedy. She helped redecorate and restore the White House. So how does today's White House reflect some of the changes that she made in her role? 
Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy is very, very famous for many reasons. Uh, one of them, as you mentioned, she got the White House to be a national landmark, a museum, and, uh, and, and started the White House Historical Association. And first ladies have followed uh, in her footsteps. A little known fact is that Pat Nixon collected more antiques and more artifacts for the White House collection than any other first lady in history. Really? Um, both Bushes have done wonderful things for the library there and expanding that and collecting books, a, a White House library that was started by Abigail Fillmore back in the 1800s. So each of these first ladies, again, have been building this from the beginning. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy was young, attractive. She came along at the right time when TV was booming. Uh, she knew how to, how to dress, how to host a good party. How, how she was historically minded. She was philanthropic, highly, highly naturally intelligent. And she was just, again, in the right place at the right time to start this tradition that had been sort of nurtured along the way, but just not as formally as Jacqueline Kennedy put it there to set the groundwork for so many first ladies to continue her work right up to today. Mm -hmm. I am so happy that you brought up that word tradition because I'm curious, are there any commonly known traditions at the White House or in general that we can attribute to a particular first lady that really stands out? One of, one of the traditions that's associated with first ladies and is one that we've talked about, Jacqueline Kennedy. Jacqueline Kennedy is the first first lady to do a themed Christmas tree. She had the Nutcracker Suite as a theme. And since then, every first lady has picked a theme. Now, there were Christmas trees beforehand. Lou Hoover had the first public Christmas tree that visitors could come in and see from the public. But as far as having a theme, that is uh, uh, what that is attributed to, to Jacqueline Kennedy. Typically, this goes around the holiday. But there are other traditions that go throughout all administrations and goes so far back like the White House China. Elizabeth Monroe was the first first lady to have an official White House China pattern and nearly every first lady has followed in suit and, and either adapted and added on to other first ladies China or done their own first ladies China pattern for state dinners. And then there's that tradition of using other administrations China for different state dinners or different events for different reasons, which has become a, a pretty neat and, and interesting thing in a way to celebrate our history. That is exactly the, the answer I was looking for, Andrew. That was that was amazing. How do you know all of this stuff about the China and, and everything? Is this from your research? Have you actually actually been to the White House and seen it with your own eyes? I have traveled to nearly every house, library, birthplace, cemetery, train station, general store, <laughs> museum for every first lady, Martha Washington, through now Melania Trump. I've been to the White House. I uh, the the the. I traveled for a year and two months for the C-SPAN series back and forth by myself across the country. And the, the schedule was so aggressive and, and I had myself to rely on for the research, for shooting, interviewing, research, audio, lighting, the site surveys, going to places that I'd never been before, working with people that I'd never worked with before. And, and if I didn't get it in the first time and get it in the can and bring it back, then we just didn't have it. And I don't like to fail. So my only recourse <laughs> was to on. succeed. <laughs> All right. We've got to step aside for a quick recess, but we'll be back right after this. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. Stay on top of the latest news and information from Fox News. Listen and download the Fox News Hourly Update on your time. The trending stories you need anytime you want it. Listen and download now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. Well, all politics aside, who of the first ladies do you think has been the most impactful throughout our history? Oh, my goodness. Impactful is, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's I mean, you could say Jacqueline Kennedy because of what she did to the White House. But but but, you know, you could go also say Helen Taft. Helen Taft donated the first dress to the Smithsonian Institution uh, uh, exhibit. And most people the world over in all the rooms I, I speak in and places I go, you think of the dresses when you think of first ladies. And Helen Taft is the first first lady to donate a dress. And now we've gone back and collected a dress to represent inaugural or otherwise every first lady of the United States. There's been so much between laws at Lady Bird Johnson and her beautification 
nation of America. There's still wildflowers and plants and billboard laws along highways that you drive up and down these roads and you don't even know that a first lady had a stamp on that or had her her fingerprint on that. Edith Roosevelt is the one who developed the East Wing and the West Wing because she had such a large family. So the the very footprint of the White House is is you, we owe that to a first lady. Um, the Christmas trees, the celebrations, the traditions. Uh, Helen Taft planted the first cherry blossom tree in Washington, D.C. Each of these first ladies has done so much that has become part of our pop culture, part of our modern life and part of our worlds that they've all been so impactful. It's it's nearly impossible to pick who's the most impactful because they've all done so much. That was what inspired me to write these books and keep speaking long after the series is that there's so much that each of these women did during their four or eight times or sometimes sadly even less to affect the world and thus the modern world around us. That's why I say, you know, if Martha, if George Washington married anyone other than Martha, we wouldn't be America and the modern world would look very, very different without America. Right. I, it's really intriguing for me to, to hear you explain all of those things that the first ladies did, because I think a lot of people don't really know the specifics of each first lady unless they do their research. So kind of following up on that question, this might be putting you on the spot a little bit, but is there anything super unique or um, something that not a lot of people know about that a first lady did that it comes to mind? Well, the first one that comes to mind, and we referenced this woman earlier, Harriet Lane. It, there's a lot of things, and this would this there has been some talk with this in the in the Trump administration when they said, well, Trump's daughter was going to be first lady, and this, that, and the, you know, a, a president's wife doesn't have to be first lady. There's no legal binding contract. Again, they're not elected. They're not. They're not. They're not paid. It's it's not a it's an honorary role. Uh, and, and Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States had no wife. He was a widower. His daughter did it. James Buchanan never married. Harriet Lane had did, did so much. She is the reason we have a national gallery of art. She uh, is the reason we have a children's wing in one of the most um, uh, renowned Johns Hopkins uh, Medical Center in Baltimore. The children's ward was started and and inspired and funded by uh, Harriet Lane. I, I mean, these women, they just do so many things that people don't realize. And that's what made me the first ladies man. I didn't I didn't go to school to be the first ladies man. I didn't study. They don't have, they don't have degrees called the first ladies man. Not yet. But once I'm done with it, I'm, when <laughs> I'm done. Well, yeah, that, yeah, there's a little there's a little spoiler, uh, uh, spoiler <laughs> teaser. I broke but, the news on this podcast. I can't wait to share. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but when you, when I went to each of these places to see how remarkable these women were, how inspiring these were, women were, how influential these women were, how they've been in these rooms and part of these discussions and part of the formation and part of these administrations and part of our country and the leadership and the success of this country from number one, from the very beginning, from before the revolution. Revolutionary War, I felt the need to tell the story. I mean, women have always been part of leadership. It's just a matter of recognizing it and giving proper credit where credit's due. And then when you realize what each of these women who have been thrust into this role, think about it. I mean, again, there's no First Ladies 101. There are some First Ladies for sure that had their eyes set on the White House and that was their goal in life and they got there. But there are other women that wanted nothing to do with politics and got there, but they still put their best foot forward. They still shine. They still did things for the good of humanity, the betterment of the world. And they And they deserve credit for all the work that they've done, that they've continued to do, and the work that they've done in the past that continues to help make the world a better place today. Yeah. And you talk about the leadership and the success of this country. I mean, last month we had the RNC and DNC. And around this time, it's often stated that the best, quote, you know, character witness for a presidential candidate is the first lady. We often get a glimpse of a president's character as a product of his wife's words at the convention. So, what legacy do first ladies have as far as presidential elections or re-elections? I mean, is there a first lady who stands out as the greatest asset to her husband's campaign? Wow, that is a great question. And they are. I mean, these these women humanize their husbands. Uh, James Madison was not a very friendly guy by all accounts. Dolly Madison threw the best parties you'd ever want to go to in your life. Uh, Calvin Coolidge was called Silent Cal. And Grace Coolidge was referred to as the first lady of baseball because she loved going to senators games. These women humanized these men. Um, 
And, and when, when they do step forward and say what a great guy he is or the great work that he does, or not even talk about their husbands, when they show what, what, what true, true shining lights they are and inspirations they are, we like their husbands by proxy. Um, uh, Sarah Polk was, was one of the only first ladies uh, not to have children. Um, she and, and James K. Polk did not have any children. And this is in the 1800s, the early 1800s, pre-Civil War 1800s. She was his campaign manager, not officially. She wasn't marching out there, but she got him prepped for speeches. She knew what his opponents were up to. And a lot of these early women, Julia Tyler comes to mind, along with Sarah Polk, went and sat in the Senate gallery, in the congressional gallery. They went to dinners. They politicked for their husbands. They knew how to sit next to each other at the dinner table so they would know how to get the conversation going. These dinners were less of a formality than they are now. And they were really event because we didn't have email. Uh, we didn't have phones, the communication, you know, it just, it, the only time you did see these people and did talk to these people were at state dinners or gathering at white houses or political meals and things like that. So they were far more important than the pomp and circumstance that they become today. And these early first ladies really, really took hold of that role and, and gave women a voice long before they could vote. Abby, you know, that there's a very famous letter that Abigail Adams wrote, and it's in the letter she wrote, Remember the Ladies. A lot of yes. people know that quote, and a lot of people have heard that quote. Clearly, you have heard that quote. I have. But I've held the letter. I've held the letter, oh, and around so that, cool. it says, Remember the Ladies, for when they were, are in your favor, the men will be on your side. What this means is, hundreds of years before women could vote, Abigail Adams knew if the ladies liked you, the husbands would vote for you. I, I, it's been forever Genius. We for a reason. I, I mean, this is before electricity. This is, I, I liken it in my speeches. You know, when I'm sitting at home, you know, I'm holding the remote. I'm sitting in front of my big screen TV. I'm holding the remote. I'm the man. I'm powerful. It's like my sword. It's my weapon. But I'm not picking the show. <laughs> Your weapon. Yeah. You, you got to share. And, and the ladies Adam, know best. I, I will Adam say that. knew before TV, electricity, she had the right to vote anything that, that men were holding the remotes, but women were picking the shows. Right, right. Um, OK, well, you obviously know everything about all first ladies. So can we do a little rapid fire? It's just a few questions. And you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. I might stump you. Who knows? Let's, let's do it. I like being stumped because it gives me a reason to, to look for more more answers. I <laughs> love that. All right. Who was the first, uh, the funniest first lady? You know, Nancy Reagan had a really good sense of humor and she proved it when she came out at a dinner dressed in like goodwill mix matched, almost like a clown because she got <laughs> criticized for spending too much money on her clothes. So if you have the ability to laugh oh, at yourself, I say awesome. that's a good hu sense of humor. So I always pick Nancy for that one. That's great. Okay. Who is the most stylish first lady mm. besides Nancy Reagan when she wore that outfit? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna, Grace Coolidge. Grace Coolidge had one of the greatest. It's, it's also the era. It's coming out of the flapper era. It's the empire era. The beaded dresses, the gowns, the brooches, the headdresses. And they say that Calvin Klein, Calvin Klein, Calvin Coolidge <laughs> could pinch a penny. We are talking about style. <laughs> it could get it was, it's on my brain. <laughs> Calvin Coolidge could pinch a penny harder than anyone else, but he spared no expense on Grace's wardrobe. And it shows mm -hmm. she just she she was always dressed to a tee. Mm -hmm. Who was the smartest first lady? Lou Hoover. Lou Hoover taught herself uh, seven different languages and designed two homes that the Hoovers would live in, both currently standing. The one in Stanford, uh, California, was where the president of Stanford lives. And she didn't have an architecture degree, just just remarkably intelligent. And the early uh, essays that she wrote as a teenager are, are inspiring. And what she thought about women's rights and what women could become in the late 1800s, uh, it brings a tear to my eye. She's just remarkable. Mm. Who was the most ambitious? Mm. Helen Taft, Hillary Clinton are the two that come to mind, and, and Mary Lincoln. Th those are three women that, that definitely took charge of 
and 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 guided the, and and helped and were huge assets to their husband's career uh, working backwards you know bill clinton had already run for a couple different things in arkansas and lost and and the fourth time he asked hillary to, to marry him he bought a house and said now you got to marry me because i can't live in the house by myself she <laughs> agreed and she was a big women's liver at wow the- that worked I, it did it, it worked <laughs> I mean, the first thing she did was she cleared out the dining room and she set it up and called it the war room and she said you're going to win an election Oh, uh, a girl. Yeah. Helen Taft, I mean, uh, uh, William Taft, President Taft, all he wanted to be was a Supreme Court justice. And 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 things eventually worked out that, that he did do that. It was a circuitous route that they got there and he had to travel through the White House first. But when Theodore Roosevelt decided to not run for a third term and the Republicans were looking for a, 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 a candidate, McKinley had just come back from doing a lot of work in the Philippines and he was a leading choice and no one was pushing him harder than Helen Taft. And Mary Lincoln writes in letters, she was courted by the president of the Confederacy and uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Stephen Douglas uh, for the Confederacy. And and she she wrote in a letter, she said, Abraham Lincoln isn't the best looking guy in town, but he's going to be president one day. <laughs> Sounds like she kicked some serious butt. That's for yeah, sure. All of them. <laughs> and then finally, who was the most beloved first lady? Oh, my and goodness. When- um, that That's that's probably Barbara Bush. Um, you, you know, the Bushes. Just wonderful people. Um I've had a lot of contact with with folks in Maine who worked very closely with Mrs. Bush. No, no first lady has her name on more buildings, more schools, more hospitals. Mm-hmm. And the thing that the the things that that woman did, even well into her eighties, she would get she would sit on the on the ground with terminally ill children on on their birthdays and her birthdays and read to them. Um, she just just a huge heart. And and I know so many people from different administrations, uh, pilots of Air Force One, uh, butlers, cooks, pastry chefs, administration people, social secretaries that have worked for m- multiple administrations. And nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, when you ask them who their favorite was that they worked with, they always say Barbara Bush. So as we wrap up this podcast, Angie, you've been amazing. Uh, What do you think is the most important thing to know about a first lady or the role of a first lady? Here's the thing that troubles me always the most. Again, I've said it multiple times here with you today. It is an unelected and unpaid role, yet we criticize it, judge it as if it is paid. You know, um, Melania Trump got a lot of grief when she walked across the the South Lawn in, in high heels. Um, if, if the people who had, who had gotten on her for that had done a little bit of history or done a little bit of research, they would have known that, you know, in the two previous administrations, two very, very incredible, accomplished first ladies, beloved and, and skyrocketing polls, Michelle Obama didn't go with her husband to visit relief efforts in in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy. Laura Bush didn't go down on all the trips to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. You know, the president thought it was she was better served other things. Melania Trump has done things that that other first ladies haven't and who are more popular. I guess what my point is that what's good for one is not always good for another. And what Mm -hmm. we criticize one for, we celebrate another. And I think we should just really understand that no one would like us coming into your house and telling you how to raise your children or how to feed your children or what to wear or how to dress or what to say. And we do this to these first ladies all the time, a lot of times more so than their husband. And and social media has not done them any favors. I think people say horrible things about Melania Trump and have said horrible things about Michelle Obama and continue. Uh, the last first lady who was who was really, really loved, no matter what anyone thought about her husband, was Laura Bush. And I think that that's because social media has entered into things and people can say mm-hmm. things without facts, unsubstantiated and be just straight up mean without having to face Um, uh, the people they criticize, those first ladies. And when you go back and you read through my books and you look through the research and you see what every first lady has done and all they've tried to do is try to make the world a better place because they've been thrown into a role because they happened to marry some guy who happened to run for president and happened to win it. A role with, with no with no uh, uh, guidelines, with no salary and no election, yet we criticize them as if. And I just like to try and lend a little historical perspective and a little relevance that maybe lets you look at these modern first ladies uh, with a little different eye. 
What a great perspective. It is true. Every single first lady has accomplished a lot of great things and they are dedicating themselves to the country just like their husbands. So that's a, that's a great way to look at it. I love that. Andrew, thank you so much. This was really fun. Um, I am going to start paying way more attention to every detail of every first lady because I feel <laughs> like there's so much to learn. There really is. I mean, again, these first ladies were so incredible. They made me the first ladies, man. I didn't I love shoot that. this. I love that. Well, I hope in your future you can meet every single future first lady. It's been a blast and I've met a number up to this point and it's just so much fun talking to folks like you, Abby. I really appreciate the time and the interest. Thank you, Andrew. You stay safe over there. You do the same. All right. If you missed anything from class, these are my office hours. And here are some top takeaways from my conversation with Andy Oak on the role of the first lady. Number one. Back in the late 1700s and early 1800s, women were unable to have much of a formal education or careers of their own. But Andy says that many of our founding fathers absolutely married up by marrying, quote, women of aptitude, natural ability, and natural intelligence. He claims that if George Washington had married anyone other than Martha Washington, we would not be having this conversation today. So although early first ladies are very different from the Ivy League graduates, the attorneys and supermodel first ladies we have today, they still had an incredible impact on our history. Number two, Andy highlights multiple times that the role of the first lady is unelected and unpaid. Unlike every other public official, nowhere in our governmental literature are the responsibilities of the first lady expressed. And although this job is both unelected and unpaid, Andy states that often first ladies are judged just as harshly as their husbands or other senior officials. And that brings me to number three. Andy reminds us that there are many ways to be a quote, good first lady of the United States. He says that what's good for one first lady may not be good for another. And that what we celebrate in one first lady shouldn't be what is criticized in the next. Andy reminds us that none of us would like it if others came into our homes and criticized the way we dressed or the way we raised our children. To that end, we shouldn't do that to our first ladies. Each family that occupies the White House will put their own individual stamp on the establishment that is the presidency. Andy, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Really fascinating to learn a little bit more about the role of a first lady and in an election year especially. For more podcasts, go to foxnewspodcast.com and don't forget to subscribe to this one on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen and leave us a review. This has been Getting Schooled with Abby Hornacek on the Fox News Podcast Network. Class dismissed. Listen to be part of the conversation with me, Brian Kilmeade. I'll talk about the biggest stories of the day and get your take along with some of the biggest newsmakers around. Listen live on the Fox News app or get the podcast at Show.com.